Hello, I'm Jay McClelland, and today I'm presenting my lecture, A Parallel Distributed Processing Approach to Mathematical Cognition. I gave this lecture at the Cognitive Science Society meeting in 2015 as the Heineken Prize Lecture. I want to start with some thanks for uh, many of the people who have supported uh, the work that I've done over the years. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize Charlene de Carvalho Heineken, who created the Heineken Prize in Cognitive Science. And I'd also like to recognize Bob Glushko and Pam Samuelson, who created the first prize in Cognitive Science, the David E. Rummelhart Prize. These prizes bring recognition to our field and obviously also an opportunity for uh, us to reflect on past successes in science and look to see how we can build on them going forward. All of my work has been in collaboration with many other people, uh, including Dave Rummelhart, Jeff Hinton, and past PDP collaborators, many of whom I've shown here. And I do want to recognize them for all of their uh, contributions to the work that uh, I received the Heineken Prize for and also for their ongoing contributions to the thinking that underlies the talk I'll be giving today. Today's talk is a forward-looking talk, and so I'd like to look forward and thank my current lab, who's joined me in my new direction, Kevin Mickey, Cameron McKenzie, Will Zhu, and Andrew Sachs, uh, been in the lab for several years as I've begun to develop these ideas. Stephen Hansen uh, joined the group and is very active in pursuing uh, some of the topics that I'll be covering in this talk. And Frank Kanayat, Ariana Yuan, Kihong Lu and Harry Blyan have all contributed uh, recently to uh, our work and will be contributing as we go forward. So let me start with the motivating questions uh, behind the new direction I've been taking with the parallel distributed processing approach to cognition. Um, the first is based on the observation that neural networks are back, but uh, there's a question, can they really think? So when we developed the parallel distributed processing framework using neural networks to model cognition in the early 80s, uh, we were motivated by the idea that neural networks provided a natural way of thinking about how we might capture natural aspects of human cognition, like our ability to see and recognize speech and figure out how to take the right action in uh, a behavioral context. And indeed, neural networks are now at the core of many devices and are doing exactly these kinds of tasks. So when you speak to Siri on your cell phone, uh, there's a neural network behind the scenes recognizing your speech. And of course, machine recognition of objects in pictures and uh, detection of patterns in video is uh, increasingly uh, growing and the field of machine learning using neural networks is a, a burgeoning enterprise. But one could still ask, are these neural networks really thinking? Are they capturing the core aspects of human cognitive abilities? Um, what makes us specifically human? Uh, and some have thought that the ability to reason with mathematical ideas and symbols really is the paradigm example of what it means to think. And so if we could take a parallel distributed processing approach there, it might, first of all, uh, be a way of finding out whether there are limits to what this framework can achieve, and secondly, to uh, developing an alternative way of thinking about what it actually does mean to think. The second motivating question, can neural networks help us understand how math learning occurs and why math is hard to learn? So many students uh, struggle to learn math, and so many times uh, people feel that new math concepts are um, incomprehensible uh, and very difficult to grasp, and they feel very much at sea as they explore these concepts. And yet we know that other people find these concepts to be completely second nature and easy to work with, at least after they've had a little experience. So um, my view is that perhaps the kind of way in which neural networks learn might turn out to be appropriate for understanding why math seems often so hard to learn at first and then becomes uh, second nature as we've learned it. The final motivating uh, question that I have is 
to understand uh, how we must extend neural networks to capture mathematical cognition. So neural networks have uh, been used for many kinds of tasks, and uh, as I said earlier, they can solve certain kinds of problems, but maybe in order to extend them to capture mathematical cognition, we will need to develop new ideas and new insights into the nature of neural networks themselves. So we'll learn more about neural networks and hopefully about how we think as we pursue these questions. So in order to have a target for my effort to apply a parallel distributed processing approach to mathematical cognition, I formulated a test. And the test is um, to see whether a neural network can learn mathematics well enough to pass the New York State Regents exam in geometry. This test is actually inspired by um, a challenge issued by the Allen Institute in their Artificial Intelligence Fellowships competition in 2014. Uh, so let's take a look at one example problem from the New York State Regents exam in geometry. The problem says, in right triangle ABC, CD is the altitude to hypotenuse AB. If CD is equal to 6 and the ratio of AD to AB is 1 to 5, determine and state the length of BD. And then the exam says, only algebraic solutions receive full credit. There's a page on which the student is allowed to write their answer to the question. It seems to me this obviously requires a good deal of thinking to solve, and therefore uh, it represents a good example of uh, a problem that uh, if a neural network could solve it, we, we would be able to say, OK, the neural network has learned how to think uh, mathematically, at least at the level of a good high school student who can pass the New York State Regents exam. And this is one of the hardest problems on the exam. Um, however, um, unlike the Allen Institute Artificial Intelligence Challenge, I wanted to um, make my challenge a bit more of a psychological one. And that is to say, I want the neural network to learn how to do this task and to act and explain its own actions in a human-like way from human-like input. So could we actually build an artificial neural network learning system that acquires mathematical ability so that it can solve these problems? So here's the plan for the talk. First, I'll provide a perspective on the nature of mathematics and the basis of mathematical intuition. And then I'll provide a perspective on the nature of knowledge and learning. Now, this part of the talk will draw heavily on the ideas originally introduced in the Parallel Distributed Processing books uh, that Dave Romelhart, Jeff Hinton, and many others uh, with me uh, developed back in the 1980s. Then we'll talk about some empirical findings and models in mathematical cognition that are consistent with this perspective. And these models will, again, draw on the parallel distributed processing framework. Then uh, the final part of the talk will involve steps that we're in the process of taking towards taking this ACID test, towards developing a learning agent that can learn mathematics to the level of being able to take the New York State Regents exam in geometry. And during that part of the talk, I'll describe the key tenets and the issues that we'll be addressing as we pursue this research plan. I think of this as a 10-year research plan. Um, we have not yet met this challenge. We are beginning down what I hope will be a successful, but probably a long road towards uh, meeting it. Finally, um, we'll end with a little bit of discussion about whether, in fact, this is possible at all and why or why not. So what is mathematics? Well, here's one view. This view is associated with people like Frege and Russell, and it could be encapsulated by the statement, all mathematics is symbolic logic. 
Uh, it's the idea that um, what mathematics is is the manipulation of expressions according to symbolic rules. Um, one articulation of such a vision in a more recent time frame were, was presented by Fodor and Politian in their critique of neural networks in 1988, in which they characterized systematic cognition as the manipulation of symbolic expressions according to structure-sensitive rules. And indeed, since the 1980s, computer programs based on these ideas have been able to process any well-formed integral differential equation, such as the one below. These computer programs have no idea what these expressions mean, but they can reduce them, manipulate them, uh, calculate uh, results through following through a set of manipulations according to structure-sensitive rules. So that's one view of the nature of mathematics. But there's an alternative vision, and many mathematicians uh, actually hold this view. Um, I found uh, a book by a man, a mathematician named Thomas Needham called Visual Complex Analysis. Um, that is to say, it's a textbook of the analysis of complex mathematics and um, he's advocating for a visual approach to this. In the preface to the book, Needham says, manipulating mathematical symbols without seeing what they mean is like writing music without ever hearing a note. Similarly, Roger Shepard, who is a very mathematical cognitive scientist, said that transformation of visualized objects of thought can convince us of the validity of mathematical and physical laws. In fact, he articulated this in his Rommelhart Prize lecture to the Cognitive Science Society and in the paper he wrote about that entitled The Efficacy of Thought Experiments. Shepard illustrated his ideas by describing a visual proof of the Pythagorean theorem. The theorem states, the sum of the areas of the squares on the perpendicular sides of a right triangle is equal to the area of a square on the hypotenuse. Shepard showed this figure, uh, which illustrates the areas of the squares on the perpendicular sides of a right triangle ABC, uh, graphically, as you can see. He then invited us to imagine sliding some of the triangles you see in the figure around, beginning with the light green triangle on the lower right. Imagine sliding that triangle up to the top of the uh, square. Then uh, the darker blue triangle on the lower right. Imagine sliding that to the left. And then finally, imagine sliding the dark green triangle down and to the right uh, so that it fills the space that's been opened up by moving those other two triangles. After you perform these uh, activities in your mind, you should have a picture very much like this one, which contains a square on the hypotenuse of each of those triangles uh, whose area is uh, obviously c squared. This is the proof that uh, Shepard presented to illustrate how the mental manipulation of objects of thought could uh, produce an understanding of the meaning of mathematical ideas. So the approach to mathematical cognition uh, that grows out of these ideas um, uh, can be captured in two key tenets that I associate with Thompson, who is a mathematics education researcher. Thompson uh, proposes that mathematics should be thought of as a set of culturally constructed systems for characterizing and reasoning about quantifiable properties of real or imagined objects, such things as the area of a square or the cardinality of a set. Mathematical expressions on this view are statements about the measurable properties of these objects and the relationships between them. So that an expression like a squared plus b squared equals c squared 
expresses this relationship between the sums of the areas of the squares on the perpendicular sides of a right triangle and its equality to uh, the area of the square on the hypotenuse. Indeed, there are approaches to the teaching of uh, mathematics and the formulation of a fully rigorous uh, framework for mathematical argumentation around uh, the concept of transformational geometry. Uh, in this framework, congruence is established by showing that objects with given properties can be brought into correspondence using transformations that preserve shape, like translation, rotation, and reflection. Intuitions about the shape-preserving properties of these transformations provide a basis for proof that then can be made rigorous by appealing to the invariances uh, mentioned above. So a critical question then arises, where do these intuitions that these ideas draw on come from? Shepard and others emphasize innate constraints that are inherent in the human mind. Stan DeHane appeals to the Kantian idea of pure intuitions that are a priori and universal. I emphasize the roles of experience and education with culturally constructed systems. This view is also articulated by Thompson, who I mentioned before, and by Reuben Hirsch, uh, who wrote a book entitled What is Mathematics Really? that emphasizes this same perspective. Now, a key part of my thinking here is the notion that experience and education with these culturally constructed systems leads to the development of habits of mind that um, are so fluent and uh, ingrained that they affect how we see both objects and mathematical expressions and become uh, very much a part of the fabric of our thinking. They become so ingrained that we forget that we acquired them, making them seem self-evident or innate. Um, 